I think that one of the most fascinating chapters in all of church history is, of course, the events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem. And we don't have a biblical record of that uh, very, very important moment that took place in 70 A.D. But what we do have is a fascinating, blow-by-blow, eyewitness account of the siege of Jerusalem and all of the things that transpired in its destruction written for us by the famous Jewish historian Josephus. Now, one of the things that surprises me is how few Christians have ever taken the time to read the history of these events that was compiled by Josephus. And every person that I've known who has taken the time to read his Jewish wars uh, is, uh, has remarked that they were absolutely enwrapped by the reading of this history because it was so fascinating. So what I want to do in our session today is look briefly at some of the main points of the report that comes down to us from history, from the pen of Flavius Josephus. Josephus was born in 37 A.D. during the reign of the Emperor Caliglia. And we don't know the exact year of his death, but we know it was after the year 100. We also know that Josephus was born into a priestly family of the Jews, but uh, when he grew up, he became not a priest, but a member of the party of the Pharisees. And he distinguished himself in his uh, earlier years as a governor territorial governor of Galilee. He also was known as a military strategist and was served as a general in the Jewish army. We know, of course, that he also was a historian, and he functioned during the siege of Jerusalem as a go-between between between the Roman armies and the officials that were holding out in Jerusalem. And how that came to pass, we'll look at in just a moment. But in the 19th century, the historical reliability of Josephus came under strong attack by critical scholars of the liberal school. Uh, Traditionally, Josephus has been one of the most respected historians of antiquity, but the 19th century critics accused him of uh, exaggeration of details and of being engaged in a kind of self-aggrandizement in his own writings, in which he was said to be tooting his own horn. However, uh, Uh, Part of that is is, uh, related to the general spirit of criticism towards ancient writers, and though we're not sure of the exact detailed accuracy of all things that uh, Josephus reports to us, at least we have the benefit of an eyewitness who was a well-known writer of his day and who was in a unique position to report on both sides of the conflict. And so the the writings that he has provided for us are extreme importance to try to understand the significance of what took place in the year 70. Now Josephus was very conversant with the writings of the Old Testament prophets. And he himself saw the destruction of Jerusalem in terms of fulfilling Uh, Old Testament prophecy. In fact, there are are some of the uh, aspects of Josephus' own writings where one might say that he fancied himself uh, something of a prophet. But if one were not even interested in the religious significance of what happened in Jerusalem in those days, just to get an insight into Roman military strength, weaponry, tactics and strategy, uh, the writings of Josephus are a treasury in that regard. He gives these detailed 
descriptions, for example, of the battering ram and how it was used, the catapult and other forms of, uh, of weaponry that the Romans uh, perfected in the ancient world and used to uh, be quite successful in their military conquests. Now, the destruction of Jerusalem did not happen overnight. It uh, began earlier with the invasion of Palestine by the Romans in the late 60s under the leadership of one of their greatest generals whose name was Vespasian. Now, in the year 68 was the year in which the Emperor Nero died, and upon the death of Nero, there was a tremendous period of internal conflict, indeed civil war, that went on in Rome, and there was a rapid succession of emperors to ascend to the throne after the death of Nero. Immediately succeeding Nero was a man by the name of Galba, who only lasted a few months until he was murdered, and then Galba was replaced by Otho, and again Otho lasted just a short time, and in the year 69 he was murdered, and then he was succeeded by Vitellius. And Vitellius was selected by the Senate of Rome to be the emperor in, in the line of succession. But the military at this time rejected Vitellius, and they called Vespasian, their favorite general, to come home from his invasion of Palestine in order to become the emperor. And so Vespasian did. He left the battlefield, went back, and was acclaimed the emperor of Rome, and he brought some stability now, once again, to the Roman Empire. And he reigned as emperor from the year 69 to the year 79, after which he was succeeded by his son Titus. Now, when he left the battlefield after the initial stages of the invasion of Palestine and was recalled to Rome, Vespasian then turned the authority of the invasion over to his son Titus. So it was Titus who presided over the conquest of Jerusalem. But what happened was when the Romans invaded, they came into Palestine and systematically uh, besieged and conquered town after town after town and village after village as they made their way to the chief citadel of Jewish strength, which was, of course, in Jerusalem. Now, one of the key earlier conflicts in the invasion, while Vespasian was still in command, was the conquest of the city of Jotapata, which was uh, in the northern part of the country. And it was governed by the general Josephus. And according to Josephus' records, over 40,000 of his compatriots were slaughtered in the wholesale destruction of Jotapata. And part of this was due to the fierce resistance that his uh, soldiers and people put up against the Roman invasion. And this is an, an aspect of the history that's extremely fascinating. It reads like a novel because obviously the Jews in this small city were no match whatsoever for the invading Roman uh, army. But the, he used all kinds of ingenious and creative tactics to repel the invaders. And at the end, there were only one or two survivors from the whole city, one of whom was Josephus, who was hiding like in a well or in a pit. And he was betrayed to the enemies and was assumed that he would be summarily executed. But according at least to Josephus' own testimony, he was spared by Vespasian 
because Vespasian had such high regard and respect for the valor that Josephus had shown in the defense of Jotapata. So what happened now was that Josephus, in a sense, was taken hostage. He was taken captive by Vespasian, and he was uh, more or less in house arrest in the quarters of Vespasian himself. Now this raised all kinds of questions to future generations because now that Josephus was spared, many considered him something of a traitor or collaborator with the Romans because he was interrogated constantly by uh, uh, Vespasian and his uh, lieutenants. But the thing that comes through the writings of Josephus is Josephus had an unbridled passion and love and affection for Jerusalem. He was the consummate Jew. He loved the holy city. And the last thing he wanted to see happen was its destruction, and not to mention the destruction of uh, Jerusalem and of the temple. And so uh, Vespasian first, until he was called back to Rome, and then later Titus, used, Ves uh, used uh, Josephus as a negotiator, as a mediator, that under a flag of truce, he would send Josephus into the city to talk to the elders who were holding out when Jerusalem was under siege. And this siege lasted for a long, long time. And Josephus tried everything he knew how to persuade the leaders in the city to surrender because he was convinced that there was no way that the garrison there in Jerusalem would, a would be able to withstand the ongoing siege of the Romans. And he would rather see the town being surrendered and at the same time he's pleading with Titus to spare the temple and spare the city if the soldiers that were garrisoned there in Jerusalem would surrender. So Josephus devoted himself to that task of trying to negotiate a surrender, and for that reason that some of the Jews believed that he was being a traitor because he, as a Jew, was calling for the surrender of the holy city. But his motivation, obviously, was to preserve the temple and the city from the destruction that did, of course, ensue. Now again, also in his writings in describing the events surrounding uh, the destruction of Jerusalem, Josephus uh, saw the hand of providence in this whole uh, uh, catastrophe. And he was warning his own people that they were about to come under the judgment of God. Now that's fascinating in light of the, the way we've been approaching these questions about the time frame references of the Olivet Discourse. Because I have argued the point that the end of the age of which Jesus speaks in the Olivet Discourse refers not to the end of the world, but to the end of the Jewish age. And he was warning the people of his generation of the impending certain coming judgment of God against Jerusalem and against the temple. And from a Jewish perspective, Josephus was making the same kind of warning to his people, looking to Old Testament passages and from the prophets of the Old Testament to warn the people that this was the promised judgment of, uh, against the ungodliness of uh, that generation. And it's also significant, as you read this and look at some of the details, that when Jesus spoke about that particular generation of Israelites, he spoke of them as being wicked to an unprecedented degree. And Josephus makes the same evaluation against his contemporaries, saying that they were the most uh, wicked of all. Now, I would like to take some time to look at some of the specific uh, uh, 
prophecies that, or, or statements and descriptions that came out of Josephus' writings, and not only those of Josephus, but also from uh, 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 the Roman historian Tacitus. And Tacitus, in many cases, confirms from the Roman perspective the accounts that are preserved for us by Josephus. Now, one of the strange uh, reports in this uh, account uh, is found in Book 5 of uh, Josephus' uh, Jewish Wars, and it has to do with the attack on the walls of Jerusalem that took place through the use of stones, great big, huge white stones that were thr pushed out of the catapult and the engines that were then hurled into the walls, and the walls were so thick that they were able to withstand this uh, assault of huge boulders being thrown against it, as well as the battering rams for a long, long time. Now, again, as a footnote to this, we remember that the walls of the temple were made of what is now called, uh, by historians, Herodian stone. This was the Herodian temple, and the stones, the individual stones that made up that temple were absolutely huge. They were massive in size. Uh, if, if you would take a look at your living room and look at your whole wall uh, in terms of its width and height, and imagine that as one stone in a wall about four to six feet deep and thick, then you get an idea of these massive stones that were used for the construction of the walls of Jerusalem and of the temple. And so it's not surprising that these walls stood so firm uh, against the attacks of the Romans. Now, of course, these stones that were hurled by the engines were not only hurled against the walls, but they were also hurled over the walls, and there they did uh, inflict considerable damage on the structures within the city and even many casualties of people who were wounded or killed by these stones. Now, uh, in the fascinating uh, 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 barrage of stones that came as, as the description of Josephus as hailstones, they were white rocks, Josephus gives this uh, record. He said that the Jews at first watched the coming of the stones, for they were of a white color, and could therefore not only be perceived by the great noises they made, but they could be seen before they landed by their brightness. Accordingly, the watchmen that sat upon the towers gave them notice was when the engine was let go and a stone came from it and cried out aloud as a warning to those who were there, the stone cometh. It's a simple warning, the stone cometh. So those that were in its way stood off and threw themselves down upon the ground by which means and by thus guarding themselves the stone fell and did them no harm. Now, one scholar uncovered that there is a variant in the translation of this record, and that certain manuscripts read, instead of the words, the stoned, the stone cometh, that the words that were used were the words, the sun cometh, not S-U-N, but S-O-N. And there were those who believed that, uh, that this related to a tradition that had developed from earlier times, according to uh, uh, one historian, that the Apostle James, who was Christ's brother, publicly testified in the temple, quote, that the Son of Man was about to come in clouds of heaven. And he sealed this testimony with his own blood. It seems highly probable, one historian writes, that the Jews, in their defiant and desperate blasphemy, when they saw this white mass hurtling through the air, raised the cry, 
the Son is coming in mockery of the Christians who had predicted the return of Jesus. So you can take that for what it's worth. There's certainly uh, controversy about it. But in addition to these details, Josephus tells us of a severe famine that befell the inhabitants in which many people died in Jerusalem by starvation because of the protracted siege. Uh, if you've ever been to Palestine, perhaps you visited the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives was called the Mount of Olives, where the Garden of Gethsemane was, which is the Garden of the Olive Press, where Jesus went for his agony of prayer the night in which he was betrayed. That that whole slope uh, across the valley from Jerusalem, just on the other side of Bethany, was a huge, dense forest of these huge and massive olive trees that would go to be three or four hundred years old. If you go over there today, you won't see a single olive tree on the Mount of Olives, and that's because during the siege that lasted so long, the Romans systematically cut down every single tree in, on that hillside and use the wood for firewood to keep warm. And so that, that's another one of the details that we learn from uh, Josephus' account. But of course, when the famine became so severe, people actually resorted to cannibalism. And Josephus uh, tells the story of one woman who was nursing her baby, and she, at the point of great starvation, she roasted her own baby and ate it. And, uh, and it was that kind of thing that uh, he recorded as part of the atrocities that took place. But again, perhaps the most difficult problem we have faced already with the Olivet Discourse and its application to the destruction of Jerusalem were the predictions of Jesus with respect to signs in the sky, astronomical perturbations, and one of the fascinating parts of the historical record of what took place are found both in the writings of Josephus as well as the writings of Tacitus. Uh, Tacitus tells us, for example, uh, that uh, there were signs that occurred in the sky uh, with respect to a comet that, uh, that had occurred uh, earlier uh, uh, in around the year 60, during the reign of Nero, uh, a comet was observed for some period of time in the sky, and to the public at that time, they saw this as an omen, as an omen of a radical change that would soon take place in the political scene. Tacitus says, quote, as if Nero were already dethroned, men began to ask who might be his successor. And Nero took the comet's threat seriously. He took no chances. As Suetonius also related, all children of the condemned men were banished from Rome and starved to death or poisoned under Nero and Nero survived the comet by several years. And then Halley's Comet appeared in A.D. 66, after which Nero committed suicide. And many historians have linked that appearance of Halley's Comet to the suicide of, uh, of uh, Nero. Now, Perhaps the strangest record of all that comes to us from the pen of Josephus is in a paragraph that I'll conclude this series or this section with by reading it to you because it is so extraordinary. Josephus writes these words. Besides these things, referring to the comets and so on, a few days after that feast on the first and twentieth day of the month of Artemisius, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those who saw it and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For before the setting of the sun, 
chariots, and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding the city. Moreover, at that feast which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking, and they heard a great noise, and after that they heard a sound of a great multitude saying, quote, Let us remove hence. Now, what Josephus reports there follows almost an identical pattern of what the prophet Elisha experienced at Dothan when his servant's eyes were opened and saw all the myriads of angels and the chariots of fire round about Elisha. And the judgments in Ezekiel and so on of the departure of the Holy Spirit from the city of Jerusalem and the judgment words of God, Ichabod, of leaving, we are departing. And what I find fascinating about this brief report of Josephus is his own obvious reticence to report it, because he senses that it is so extraordinary that people will think he's nuts for telling this story. But as he says, he was compelled to tell it for two reasons. One, because so many people uh, bore witness to it, and two, because it was consistent with the seriousness of this historical moment. And so he sees in the fall of Jerusalem and in the destruction of the temple a divine act of vengeance on his own people.